In terms of the uh, implications uh, for um, companies in Ireland, uh, the, the Brexit situation, if we might address that first. Um, Alison, you've, uh, uh, with your husband Michael and uh, colleagues, um, have set up East Coast Bakehouse. And obviously, uh, at the time, I'm sure it sounded like a great idea in the, in the context of Brexit and uh, uh, where you might see yourself selling your, your products. Uh, what, what do you think has changed and, and should you keep going? has been in the planning for a number of years, uh, both in terms of the proposition we've been developing for manufacturing uh, on a large-scale basis, uh, biscuits, but also from a funding perspective and commissioning a factory, etc. So I, I suppose you could say in terms of timing, it couldn't be worse for us. Um, it, it's happened at a moment when we're about to, to, to launch into the UK market, particularly on our private label um, offering. So yes, I think we have to be honest and say it's not good news. But you could also say, you know, sometimes the, the, the best time to address radical changes to your strategy are at the beginning where you haven't had a whole legacy of, of, of ways of doing things and, and, and processes and, and uh, uh, various items embedded in your company already. So I think we're at a very dynamic phase as a company. So pivoting to uh, change to a new market uh, is something we're going to have to consider. Um, but I would echo really a lot of what uh, we heard from Una earlier. Um, you know, we're, we're all at a time of enormous uncertainty, but some of the, the truisms really do, uh, do, do still sustain. So when you look at issues like product quality, um, the sustainability agenda, which Ireland is, is really unique and well-placed to promote uh, across the world um, and in the UK, I think we've got a lot, a lot of positives to build on. Perhaps the, um, the list of priorities in terms of how we position ourselves both as a company and as an industry may change in that we, we become more value added. Uh, we, we talk about sustainability and product quality and, and all of those things that we, we have been working on over the last number of years. But I think we, perhaps we pivot and change the prioritization of how we present those, both in terms of how we organize our business and how we present them to, to future clients. So yes, I mean, uh, if we were to believe uh, all of the negativity that we're hearing. I think most companies who are tending here today would fold up the tent and go home. But uh, one of the things, that perhaps the positives that we can take from all those economic charts that we've seen today is we have been here before. We have been at this position in terms of radical changes over the last number of years through recession, through the currency crisis, and, and, and back further. So I think we have to be nimble and dynamic, and, and we've got to, to, to move with the times. You know, if we want to be really facetious about it, if it was easy, anyone could do it. Um, we believe that we're, you know, as a company, not just individually, but I think everybody here in the room believes that you just have to face these challenges head on, and we will succeed. Uh, Una, the, you, you, there's a slight reference there to uh, you know, taking things a bit further afield and so on, but uh, you did mention yourself that the minister uh, down on his Asia trip and uh, uh, opening a new office for Board B in Singapore. But uh, the interesting thing, I think, coming out of that was Glen Isk were being pumped very hard down there. One assumes they see a big opportunity there outside the market. Uh, how realistic are these opportunities outside the UK? How much can we divert companies away from the UK and take up opportunities in these far-flung far markets? I think um, if you actually look at the diversification of our export growth over the last 11 years, our share of international markets has actually increased whereas our share of the British market has come down. There was a time when we were 50% dependent on the UK. We're now at 41%. So that has been naturally coming down. It's been coming down with uh, continental Europe on the increase, but particularly international markets on the increase. Now, that's not the same for every sector or for every company, um, but it's a general trend. And we have a number of companies who are succeeding in distant markets. Um, we've been participating in Gulf Food now, uh, a trade fair in the Middle East for some many years, and we've seen our footprint expand at that show. Um, and we have a waiting list for Gulf Food 2017. Um, in fact, we've, we're seeing a surge in demand for our trade fairs generally across the board. Um, there are new trade fair formats which have evolved that have really helped the industry to diversify as well, like the PLMA show in Amsterdam, which is not just about British buyers, it's about multiple buyers from other countries. 
Um, but I think these opportunities, to answer your question, the opportunities for those companies are indeed very real. We have seafood companies who are relatively small, who are selling well into China. I mentioned a company earlier who's just beginning to work in Singapore. These are opportunities that can be availed of. They need to be managed from a risk point of view, but the, the potential is certainly there to diversify beyond Britain. But it doesn't mean for a second that Britain isn't a really important market to us. That the relationships we have with British retailers are relationships that have been there for very many years. You'd only have to hear Larry today about his 40 years in the business. You know, they're more than 40 years old. Um, they're a long time there, and we, ha we cannot lose sight of that. Um, as Michael said earlier, they need secure food supply, they need high quality food, and we will be there to provide it to them in some shape or form, possibly in a more premium way than we've done before. Uh, Kevin, um, you're responsible for foreign direct investment uh, on the food sector in uh, Enterprise Ireland, and uh, up to now it might have been a relatively uh, straightforward task, but with the Brexit, a lot of the food manufacturers here in fact are saying we should be in fact investing in the UK, which obviously I'm sure is not your brief to encourage them to, to move over, but the reality is a lot of them will take that option up, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, what, what can you offer uh, by way of trying to attract uh, uh, companies into Ireland now that uh, probably the biggest market uh, is likely to be closed? Well, <clears throat> I suppose uh, in the first instance, I'd say that Brexit hasn't actually turned into anything concrete right now. I mean, it, it was as much as a surprise uh, to us as it was to the um, betting agencies. Now, they don't normally get things wrong. Uh, certainly for some industries and certain products, industry wants to be right beside where the consumer is anyway, especially if you've got products which are very low margin products or very short shelf life. And to be honest, we were never really in the market for winning those projects in the first place. There may be other projects where they're looking solely at the UK indigenous market. And I think you're correct in saying that, whereas in the past, that wasn't an issue for us from a regulatory perspective uh, to get the product over to the UK. That will b become a problem for us in the future. Actually, uh, in terms of our pi business pipeline at the moment, uh, a lot of the products that, that where the companies are looking to have an international presence in Ireland, they are looking at the EU market. They're starting to come around to the idea that the UK won't be part of that but they're also looking at global markets. So if you take, for instance, in the infant formula business where we have a very strong pipeline of business, uh, companies are looking at global markets. So it's, we're talking about high margin, shelf stable products that have to be manufactured to the, to the highest standards in the world with very, very good quality raw materials. So in, in that sense, nothing has changed in that regard. We have been hearing, I suppose, in the other direction, and we have been getting calls from British companies who, were, who are reconsidering their investment program and looking at potentially having an operation in Ireland to serve uh, the rest of the EU market. Mm. Interesting. Michael, I suppose uh, you would uh, probably welcome uh, some of the Irish uh, producers in the South deciding that the easiest way to stay within the net in the UK is, is to go north of the border and uh, open up facilities there. Is there any um, indication that government, in fact, is part of their, their new strategy to attract uh, FDI uh, into Northern Ireland as opposed to the South uh, in, in terms of hitting the UK market? Or is that not part of the... Um. Short answer, not really. Um, there is very little FDI in agri-food in Northern Ireland. Most of it is LSI, which I encourage my friends in economic development to use, local sustainable investment. So it's indigenously grown uh, and has grown to critical mass. Um, on a personal note, uh, the integration of the two industries is not helped by currency distortion across the border. Uh, it actually damages both industries. Um, and I go back to the point that I made. The industry north and south are to a very large extent codependent on each other. Uh, a good example of that is uh, animals don't actually understand that there's a border. And there are a number of different ways that you can take that but the more you think about it. Um, equally, animal diseases don't know there's a border. And we share the ability 
to damage each other's industrial sectors hugely by dropping the ball at some point going forward. So that's back to the standards issue. That's back to the collaborating to drive exports off these islands further and further afield. Um, if you want a model for that, look at Tourism Ireland, where effectively the Northern Ireland Tourist Board and the Irish Tourist Board compete in Britain and collaborate in China. Mm. Uh, I think there's a lot to be learned from that model. A anybody like to ask the, the panel any questions? While you're thinking about it, and I'll be back to you. Uh, Alison, uh, you, you set up a uh, company for investing in food uh, uh, industry startup some years back. Um, right now, uh, if you had a half million and you wanted to invest in some startup scale-up companies, would you say to them, go establish a plant in the UK, or, or what would your advice be? Interesting question. Uh, I mean, it, it probably really depends on the proposition and, and the individual, um, the individual investment. Um, you know, one of the things I think that the default has always been in startups in this country to look at the UK first. Um, I suppose, in one sense, it goes back to our very close relationships with the UK. It also goes back to you know something which isn't very, very often mentioned, but our language issue because we are we are much more comfortable dealing with the UK and and, and clearly through the language. So. Uh, I, I think the you know the easier option has always been to do what's familiar. Um, from a, an investment perspective, I think going forward we have got to start looking further afield. The diversification process is is difficult. Um, getting into markets like France and Germany it involves a lot of legwork, a lot of different distribution models. But you know you have to start somewhere. So. Um, I think you know we, 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 we've seen very long timescales today of how long it's going to take for this to un, uh, unwind the whole the whole Brexit scenario, the ten years and whatever. But who knows? I think you know we, we've got to start looking at, at other options from the beginning. So um, yeah, I'm not sure. I would I would look to, to maybe reinforce the relationship with the UK, perhaps look at some other markets and and start from the beginning with those. The, the exchange rate is obviously one of the big uh, factors that's uh, making our exports into the UK, uh, shall we say, non-competitive to a certain extent at the moment. But if there's tariffs come in, it just uh, it kicks it in worse, and probably we, we could overcome one without the other. But uh, if, we, if we're to look down the line a bit further, there seem to be some indicators from the econo economic kind of views this morning that the change in exchange rate was permanent rather than something that would come back. Uh, so, in those circumstances, um, I think we're looking at a situation where either the food industry gets horribly, uh, shall we say, decimated, or it gets extremely, extremely efficient. Uh, Kevin, uh, I would say, when you're talking to these large companies coming, are they much more efficient than the Irish indigenous food uh, industry? Or, well, <clears throat> I suppose a lot of them would be at significantly bigger scale, and as I said, you know, they're focused on global markets. Um, in fact, you know, I've had conversations with some of the ones in the infant food business who are concerned that the price of milk, for instance, is too low. They would like to see the price of milk going up because they want farmers to be producing more milk because they need it uh, to feed their huge investments that they've made in the country. I think from an Enterprise Ireland perspective, and if I look more globally than just in foreign direct investment, uh, we, we reacted immediately to the, the Brexit, which, as we say, nobody was expecting to happen. Um, we, we conduct a, an annual business survey every year, so we were able to, to analyze our own figures and identify the companies that were most exposed to the sterling market. Uh, we contacted uh, those companies individually to ascertain whether they had a currency risk management strategy. And then we put in a five-pillar uh, program, uh, starting off with uh, increased information on, on the UK market, dedicated helplines, and also bringing them together with expertise in uh, currency risk management where they didn't have that in-house. Um, as touched on by, by Una, um, market diversification is something that we're pushing very hard. We have a lot of programs around market diversification, as she's quite rightly said, and if we take the global Irish exports, 45% um, 10, 10 years ago went to the UK, now it's 37%. We have a kind of a two-pronged strategy here. One is we want actually to grow our business in the UK. So we're going to put more resources into trying to make that happen. Equally, we want to see it as a percentage fall further so that our companies are diversifying in, in uh, far-flung markets. And how they're doing that is through innovation. So we, we're spending um, 
a lot of uh, taxpayers' money uh, investing in the innovation programs of our companies because we see that is where they're getting a better, better margin in the marketplace and getting better market share. Have we got any questions for the panel? Guys, anybody uh, selling it to Northern Ireland like ask Michael a question or two? <laughs> no? No, oh, here we go. Okay. We're not selling into Northern Ireland because we come from there, but uh, basically, um, what's the consideration about productivity has been the answer really to exchange rate movements? Uh, is there room for more productivity in the total industry in order to overcome the effects of the exchange rate? Uh, you got that. It's, uh, is there room in the productivity to overcome the exchange rate differences or what? Uh, that's a very, very good question. Um, there is considerable room for productivity gain uh, both on farm and in manufacturing. Uh, that will require considerable change in behavior. And that's a very difficult thing to do in both those communities because they're very, very attached to the behaviors that they've adopted for the last 40 years. Um, that's where government needs to come in and help uh, facilitate change. Uh, the largest second largest agricultural conference in the world took place in Belfast two weeks ago with nearly 1,600 delegates from 70 countries. The amount of research that is being done on primary agriculture is vast. The amount of it that's being implemented, I could put on my hand. So we need to start uh, rewarding productivity gain and, and government needs to reset the targets a bit with industry and say productivity is something that we're very interested in, albeit it must be sustainable productivity. You know, it, we can't undermine the environmental gains we've made. So if you like, that's the primary side. On the manufacturing side, we really haven't seen robotics come into manufacturing yet to any large extent, uh, and that has to be the next phase. Uh, Kevin, uh, in terms of R&D in the sector, um, in the agricultural sector as opposed to any other sector, uh, are you seeing you know, a bigger take up in the agri-food sector or does it tend to lag? Uh, Michael mentioned robotics. I mean, equally, you could mention you know, the, the drones coming in and uh, the, delivering yeah. and so on. But, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> well, we, we, we do have a, a three-stage uh, program on lean manufacturing in Enterprise Ireland's offer. Um, so three levels going up to very, very large transformational change and a starting one where it kind of gets the ball rolling and where companies tend to see pretty immediate payoff. Um, but in terms of um, innovation and where we're putting our money, so um, we have a uh, Me Technology Centre that Enterprise Ireland has, uh, has agreed to fund. Uh, it's quite a significant uh, spend uh, over five years of about 20 million euro. Uh, but it's, it goes back to what, what, what you were saying earlier, Mike, about um, creating more value and identifying, let's say, if you're talking about in the, in the beef sector or the, or the pork sector or whatever, extracting more value from the carcass, turning it into ingredients that, that, are, that are, let's say, shelf-stable and can be sent all around the world. For instance, if you take the, the, the pet sector, there's a huge drive for more protein in pet food. So they want to get rid of the grains, they want to have healthy ingredients for, for the consumer, which is a dog, but actually the consumer is the owner who picks the, the stuff off the shelf. But there's a huge drive around, let's call it, turning pig's ear into a silk purse. And that's what we're trying to facilitate in Enterprise Ireland uh, so that our, our client companies and, and Board B as client companies can have a, have a better competitive advantage in global markets. So thinking outside the box seems to be the way forward, guys. So uh, start thinking outside the box. And we've reached the end of our time slot here. Um, thank you very much to all the panel. Can we give them a big round of applause?